Let's begin with a quick word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Lord, we give you thanks this day for your presence among us, for the blessing of baptism, for the gift of a new priest in Hunter Ruffin. And Lord, we give you thanks that you were revealed to us in storytelling, that through sharing our stories, hearing other stories, and engaging this world, we can understand you more acutely and be more aware of your presence in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so I have to begin uh, today's uh, class. This is a book I read, gosh, in 2003, 2004, somewhere in there. Absolutely loved it. It's uh, about 650 pages long, but it took me about two days to read. It's that kind of book. It's well written. It's very quick read, at least for me. It was magnificent. Um, and they asked me last year, what do you want to review? And I said, well, I'd love to review this book, but there's some themes in there that are a little bit racier. Maybe I'll wait and do that the second year. <laughs> After I get to know people and they can trust me a little bit. Um, and then the other side of it was, I, earlier in the week they, they came to me, Lowell and company came and said, hey, why don't we do one of these online promos where you can review the book Cavalier and Clay? And I said, oh great, I've mispronounced the name the whole time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the guys, the, one of the main protagonists is Yosef Cavalier, and because when I was reading the book, and I didn't have anybody sounding it out to me, I read Yosef, and so went with a French accent, and so I always thought it was Cavalier and Clay, um, instead of Cavalier and Clay, so I'm already, again, you learn all kinds of things when you start working with books. Um, so, the, the Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, Absolutely, I, I love the book. Um, I put on here, it's a midrash on comics, heroes, and life. Midrash is a Jewish term that uh, is basically the art of storytelling within a story. So you tell a story on top of a story on top of a story, each illustrating the one before it and giving you a deeper knowledge of the one before it, which I think is absolutely what this book does um, brilliantly. So let's see if we can get the... Or I'll just point this everywhere, see what's happening. Well, yeah, open the door and see if that helps. I'll shoot right at it. Oh, I, I, have a, I have the manual labor, all right. Is that, well, Michael Chabon, that's all right. I can do this without. Are you gonna, do you want to press the button each time, or we can put this up here? Which, all right, he's born in Washington, D.C. Um, in 63. Um, he discovered he wanted to be a writer at the ripe old age of 10, doing a creative report, and actually has dedicated his whole life to that. Um, at age 25, he published The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, which fascinated the left, I, this hasn't happened to me, and very few people I know. He turned in his master's thesis, and the, the teacher said, that's so brilliant, I'm going to submit it to a publisher he got a $300,000 advance on the publishing deal and um, put out the book and it became a number one bestseller in the New York Times. Um, boom. He's an amazingly gifted and skilled artist. Um, the, the fun part then is, of course, he, because he immediately started rocketing to stardom, they uh, said, hey, they started being on all these publishing lists and all this kind of stuff and he was invited to be on the um, Times, or People's 50 Most Beautiful People. I'm going to click on the next one and they'll pull up his picture. You can see how pretty he is. Aww. Um, he turned it down, though, saying that he wanted to be a serious author, and indeed he is a serious author. So, sorry, you have to just click away. Click. <laughs> so, this point at you. And <laughs> so, next page. Um, Michael, uh, so d just after he had this huge initial success, he sat down to write his second book, one that uh, was called Fountain City, which in theory was about a perfect baseball park in Florida um, and this sort of magnum opus kind of thing. And he kept writing and kept writing and writing until he got to 1,500 pages and couldn't find his way out. Um, he, got a, <laughs> he got a divorce and his wife took half, I guess like any divorce, took half of what he had, took half of the advance, so he felt completely stuck. He couldn't pay the money back for the advance. He didn't know what else to do, so he said, okay, well, I'll just sit down and start writing another book. And in, um, in that process, he created Crady Trip, Grady Trip, rather, a frustrated novelist 
who spent years working on an immense fourth novel. Mm. Uh, it became what is Wonder Boys, which was a movie with Michael uh, Douglas, great little movie. Um, and again, he just didn't tell anybody about what, he had, what had sort of happened in this process. They published it, it was a huge hit. Wonder Boys was a big, big, big deal, and he continued with his sort of successful trajectory. Um, go back one, sorry about that. So Washington Post critic, after those first two books, and again, he's a Washington boy, um, one of the critics said he loved the book, loved Wonder Boys, but noted that everything tended to be sort of related back to Michael's life. And so suggested with fictional explorations of his own, um, it's time for him to move on to break away from the first person and explore larger worlds. Siobhan took this critique to heart, and that's when he started writing uh, Cavalier and Clay. Now, now we can go to the next one. So click on the first one there. Um, he basically started talking, he found a box of comics in his sort of cleaning out some of his parents' stuff and remembered his love for comics. So he went back to the golden age of comics, which is 1938 or 39 to 1950s. Um, incidentally, the golden age of comics, and I love this, this is a classic American thing, especially for both America and the 50s. Um, the golden age of comics lasts from 30 to about 1954 when Congress had a hearing about the detrimental effects of comic books on young lives. <laughs> That's usually marked as the end of the golden age of comics, because, whoa, those things are terrible. Um, so, the resulting book was published in 2000 to rapturous plays. Many declared it Chabon's magnum opus. Um, it probably is. Um, it won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 2001, and Brett Easton Ellis, another famous author declared it um, one of the top three books of his generation, um, which is when another author says that, another award-winning author says that about your work, you know, you know you're there. Um, Siobhan clearly loves the work because he's actually gone back and written more about it later and some short stories and other stuff, so there's something about this story that's captivated him even in a variety of ways. Um, so just a quick overview, the book follows 16 years in the lives of Samuel Sammy Clayman and Yosef Joe Cavalier, two Jewish cousins who create a popular series of comics. Um, the book opens, and this is where I love Siobhan just plays with this so brilliantly. It opens with a comic books convention and they're sort of recalling all the wonderful works that these guys wrote and did, a, a comic called The Escapist. But Siobhan gets so deep into this world, he actually has footnotes about an imaginary comic, keep in mind, but he has a footnote about the, the Escapist 1954 edition sold for $100,000 in auction in 2003. Um, it's pretty <laughs> hilarious. I mean, he really, he layers and layers and layers all that on there. Um, so you get a feel like you're really in this world. Um, but it's the Escapist, which he links the creation to Harry Houdini and his metamorphosis trick. That is, the notes that Chabon really plays with here is Houdini didn't just escape from a situation. He called his tricks a metamorphosis. That meant he changed. Something changed about escaping from those situations. Something changed in Houdini and in the audience, and the magic was in that transformation as much as it was in the escape. So the book flashes back and forth um, to Prague, and uh, we learned that Yosef was uh, um, blah, 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 smuggled out in a box for the Golem of Prague. Has anybody heard of a Golem before? One, one or two, okay. Most have not. We're, I'll explain it to you. All right, so next one. This is the Golem of Prague. Um, all right, this is Gollum from uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, a different guy, Gollum, Gollum. Um, Gollum, you can click to the next one. This crowd didn't get that joke, it's okay. <laughs> Um, so what is a golem, my Christian friends? Uh, it comes from the Hebrew golim, um, which comes from a psalm, which just means an unformed being. And this sort of nexus of Jewish tradition, thought, mysticism, and just sort of folklore, really, um, it bubbled up that a golem became a clay man, like, I, like that image I showed you, very unformed, but you would animate this clay man using scripture to be a defender of your community, which needless to say, the Jewish community has needed enormously in the last 2,000 years. Christians, have, we have not been 
good brothers and sisters to our Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, and so anytime anything would happen, the golem would famously be someone that they would pray would rise up and would help defeat these forces or, and support and protect the community. He was known as the man of clay, and he always has the sort of Frankenstein aspect to him. It's very common for the golem to be animated in the folklore and Judaism, and he, they send him out, protect the people from this, and then he ends up going haywire because he's a dumb block of clay, and he <laughs> causes all kinds of havoc, and he protects them, but then when he protects them, he accidentally steps on somebody, or he <laughs> pushes somebody in a river, or all that kind of stuff. He's always this sort of semi-tragic figure. Um, the most famous of those stories was the Golem of Prague, and Shaban plays brilliantly with this, plays brilliantly, and he names it over and over again. The Golem um, becomes a central character throughout this book um, as one who fights for the community, um, and he, again, he plays with it almost hammering it because, well, if you're a Christian, you're not a Jew reading it, you don't have a clue what he's talking about, so he has to push it a little bit, um, but he plays with it especially because Yosef escapes from Prague in the case, in the actual case that the Golem was supposed to be in. So you immediately have to start saying, okay, is Joseph the Golem, or who's the Golem in this situation? Who's protecting his community? All right, so the next one. Um, Kornblum is a magician who helps him do that. I sort of skipped ahead a little, but that's all right. Um, and it has a brilliant line. Um, Kornblum is a, this sort of turn of the century, turn of the last century, magician who believes all his stuff. He's a very Houdini escape kind of figure, but he's a wonderfully fun figure because he actually believes in magic. He knows all the tricks and all the secret doors and all the ways that a magician uses, and yet he still believes in magic, that there's something in this world that changes and transforms people. Again, that sort of idea of metamorphosis. Um, but he helps... Yosef escape, and he has this brilliant line, Yosef is all concerned about getting out and escaping from Nazi-occupied Eastern Europe and Prague. He's worried, 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 and Yosef gives him probably the best advice in the book, and that is, um, forget about what you're escaping from, reserve your anxiety for what you're escaping to. He has all these dreams of America as the perfect place, and of course, Kornblum, having been a touring magician, probably has a pretty good insight that you, you think you know what you're getting away from, but you don't know what you're getting yourself into either. Um, so in the case of Joe and Sammy, they create a comic called The Escapist to serve as their golem, um, as one who fights for the evils and wrongs, both foreign and domestic, and who gets out of any tight spot with panache, and usually having learned something new. That's, that's the, the conceit of the comic that they write. Any questions on, on this sort of idea of golem Man of clay, fights for right. Okay, go to the next one. So, can anyone name, all right, go slow on these. Can anyone name our great American golem? Anybody think of what our golem would be? Superman, yeah, go ahead. Click on the next one. He was created by two Jewish friends, Simon and Schuster. Click, click. Uh, he started as a comic book character. Click. Uh, they endowed him with powers to fight evil around the world. And like Moses, he was saved by his parents and put on a boat to a foreign land. Sound familiar? Yeah, <laughs> Superman. All right, so um, we're going to play with Superman for just a few minutes because it's just fun. Uh, and he does in the book as well. He plays with this in the book as well, and, it, and it's supposed to bleed over with the escapist in both. Um, Simon and Schuster, I mean, Simon, Simon and uh, Siegel and Schuster, rather, created Superman in 33. Um, and they have these layers of things that we don't hear as Jews, I mean as Christians, but fellow Jews would hear. All right, what is, does anybody know Superman's name, his, his biological name? We'll see how many comic books need. Clark Kent. All right, Clark Kent. Kent is the Americanization of Cohen, which is priest in Hebrew. All right. Uh, does anybody know his real name or his Krypton name? Kal-El. That's it. Kal-El. Um, E-L. And he's, his house is known as the House of El. His father is Jor-El, and he is Kal-El. Does anybody know what El is, E-L? God. It's the Hebrew word for God. Elohim, or El, is God. So, they literally name Superman Kal-El. Kal can be one of two things. It's either the present tense of verbs. So, it's either present God, or it could be Kali, voice of God. 
He's either the voice of God or present God, depending on which sort of translation you want to use with the word. So that's literally what these two Jewish kids come up with their golem and come up with it. Instead of a man of clay, they call him the man of steel. Absolutely. This isn't real deep, folks. This is not, I don't have to dig deep for this one. This is, Superman is Jewish. Um, it's, it's there. It's right there in front of you. Um, there was a great article Rich Goldstein wrote in Salon.com called Superman is Jewish, where he really goes through a host of these, and some of the ideas get really, really sort of far-fetched. Um, and some of them make perfect sense. I mean, there's two Jewish guys. What do they give Superman? Cur curly hair. He's got the curl. That's the most fam one of the most identical parts of him, of course, because most Jewish men have curly hair. Not the end of the world, but it's just these connections. Um, <clears throat> go ahead and go to the next one there. So, um, it may feel superficial, but it is, it is right there. So, let's see. Let me turn my page. Um, Superman seen fighting evil around the world, but especially in those beginning years, he was very much against Hitler. He was started in 39. He's right there in the middle of it, in, the, in the late 30s, and everybody knew what was happening in Europe. They knew what was going on. And so these two Jewish guys come together and they create this guy who's fighting fascists and Nazis around the world. And finally, in 1939, there's this great image. Put it up there. It should be the next click. Oh, that's all right. Superman can be found throttling Hitler. He can just keep clicking through. To which famously Goebbels declared Superman es ein Jude. Superman's a Jew. And that's the actual cartoon that uh, Nazi Germany noticed. And then they had to put out counter, um, a counter story that condemned. Of course, Superman was popular to a certain degree, even in Germany. And so Goebbels, because of this little, let me, uh, the great line, I'd like to land a strictly non-Aryan sock on your jaw. It, keep in mind, this is before um, everything came out with the Holocaust. Judaism was still not a popular thing, and you couldn't have a Jewish comic book character. So the closest they could get is the code language. Well, I'm a non-Aryan, by God, and I'll punch you in the face. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you're coming with me while I visit certain pal of yours. Um, but Germ they actually had to go out there. Um, Germany actually printed propaganda now condemning Superman and how the evil of Superman because of this comic. Um, but the Gollum fought for the community as he was created. Superman fights for truth, justice, and the American way, right? Does anybody know what Torah teaches? Truth, justice, and freedom. That's the, that's the hallmarks of Again, this is not really deep stuff. It's right there. If you know, if you know Judaism, right there. Go ahead, click. So, um, so here's the brilliance of Shaban. He is drawing on Superman. He is drawing on the Golems. He's drawing on Houdini. He's drawing on this nexus of things that are all right there with this idea of escaping, which, of course, to a certain degree is the great American dream, right? We escape from whatever our bonds are. That's what people have famously said. Houdini um, was not necessarily a master magician, but he tied into that deep American hope of going to something better, being something better, escaping your roots and being whatever you want to be in this wonderful new world. That was Houdini's greatest trick, many people argue, is that he tied into that. He showed people that there was a way, especially immigrants and those who were coming to America, Shaban ties into all of this, ties into golems, ties into this explicit age of comic books um, within, but he casts it within this vision of the escapist. Instead of calling it Superman, and Superman, let's be honest, is a little vagueish around that stuff, he went back and said, no, 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 let's name it. We're going to call him the escapist because that's what they do. They escape. They don't necessarily always win. Superman very rarely solves the world's problems and creates peace. He just has to go around and stop things, bad things from happening, and then hope it doesn't happen again, but it always does, and he has to go back in. Instead, the escapist escapes from those situations and tries to do something better the next time. So um, it's a metaphor of escape and transformation that Cavalier, or Cavalier, sorry, life, as well as the movements of Sammy claim into the socially acceptable place. So they, we've sort of, I've shifted here a little bit. Um, this is getting more into it. They give the name of um, the escapist there. And so they begin a transformation. What the rest of the book watches and charts is you have two Jewish cousins, uh, Cavalier and Clay, 
and we're going to chart and see how well they can escape their background and their roots and their system and how well or how poorly they do it, how much they can be who they are or how much can they create something new. The whole book is a chart, a flow of this. And that's why, again, that's why I just loved it. Because every page you're turning and it's just, are they gonna do it or are they not gonna do it? It's almost written to a certain degree like a comic book and it's written in his style, which is very light, but uh, elegiac. It's, oh, I love it. Um, anyway, so uh, Joseph very quickly learns he has to change his name to Joe because Yosef is not really an American name. So he just goes by the good old American Joe. And Sammy switches from Clayman, a very Jewish name, to Clay. And so you have already in those first, just a, this is the first four or five chapters, they switch their names around to Joe um, and Sammy. And off they go as two good American kids, not Jewish kids. They have to start deciding about how Jewish they want to be or not. Um, this is a common theme in Shaban's work. Um, but go ahead and click the next one. All right, any, any questions about golems, about escapists, about any of this kind of stuff? Bring up anything? Yes? How about a question about um, Shabon? Is he Jewish? He is Jewish, proudly Jewish. And Many of his books deal with that same kind of theme. I don't, I don't know how observant he is. Um, my assumption would be that he's relatively observant, but I, I, couldn't, I can't name that for him. Um, there are... Uh, there's sort of two or three different types of Christians as well as Jews, I would assume. And that is you have the ones who show up on every Sunday. Then you have that group who actually think about it all the time. And they may not be in church, but they come up with questions that you're like, wow, you're clearly praying, working, and studying. I would put him at least in that second category. Of his, I mean, his whole, almost all of his works are meditating on what it is to be Jewish, on what it is to be a person of faith. He's, he's wrestling with it. I don't know if he was observant in the every every Saturday going to Sabbath kind of thing. Um, and the other, the other group is the culturally like, well, I show up for Christmas and Easter and, or for Passover and Yom Kippur. But um, I, I would at least put him in that middle category. I can't name what he is or not. Another question? Yes. Any significance to the fact that it was substantial or fraud? Um, no, I think he just took it because there's that history of the Golem of Prague. And there's two or three statues. There's another statue that looks an awful lot... Um, so there's that sort of really unformed one, and then there's another one that's much more formed, and it looks a lot like, it's pretty hilarious if you want to talk about someone else who has lifted ideas. Um, the Golem of Prague, if you Google it, the other image for Golem of Prague is an exact replica made 200 years before of um, Darth Vader. <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. He's got the black cape and a helmet that comes over his face, and you can't see him. It's all that kind of stuff. Oh no, no, he doesn't bring midrash to to the get to the work. I, I apply that. I have used that. I use I use the word midrash a lot because especially for for a lot of the Jewish conversations, um, because it's just such a brilliant storytelling technique, where they tell a story to explain another one. He doesn't use that in this term, um, and typically midrash is used to explain the Bible. He never enough, he doesn't get into the Bible as much in this text, um, but it's he's still telling a story to explain a story. So it's that sort of process. Bill, as you know, there are uh, gargoyles all over the National Cathedral yes. in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Any linkage between the bonds and gargoyles? Because they both have the same... The sort of golem and, gar and gargoyle combo? Mm -hmm. um, not as much. Most gargoyles are intended to scare away evil spirits. Okay. Um, while the golem, again, is, is much more, this is going to be our champion in battle kind of model. So they have a different role okay. to play. But, but they have some physical resemblance. They have some, yes. They do. They do have some semblance and, and, and relationship, absolutely. Cousins. Cousins, yeah, they're certainly good. <laughs> they ain't unrelated. <laughs> oh, Gumby? Yeah, no, it's not Gumby. <laughs> He's maybe as unformed, but not, it's not Gumby. All right, so uh, we'll click again um, to get into the, a little bit more of the story. So he decides to break away. You know, he takes that advice to break away. <laughs> Um, but I just have to name the fact that you know he want, he's exploring mid-century America. That's absolutely the case. 
But if you listen, think back to when he was writing his first book, he's ap- he was, Shaban is absolutely the escapist himself. He gets out of that first book deal where he writes 1,500 pages in the wrong direction and then turns around and writes The Wonder Boys and makes a mint doing that and somehow saves his own hide. He, I would argue that while he got away, certainly in setting from his original theme, he's neck deep in the escapist because he just did it. <laughs> and when he was writing this book, he had just escaped from his own sort of prison and gotten out and written another book and, and then come, turns and has this sudden idea and theme of the escapist. It, it was pretty close to his heart. How close to his heart? He went back um, to the comic genre and collaborated on a book, if you want to click the next one, that is called um, Michael Chabon Presents the Amazing Adventures of the Escapist. He actually wrote or helped him as part of writing, went back and supposedly wrote the comic that was in the book. I mean, it didn't exist. He just went back and invented that with everything else, published it, um, and then actually clicked the next one. He won an Eisner Award, which is the Oscar for comic books. So not, I don't know how many this times this has happened, but he wrote a book, got a Pulitzer Prize for it, then wrote it back and wrote a book that was supposed to be featured in his book and won another award for that one. <laughs> not too bad, not too bad. All right, so we'll get into the actual stories here. Um, They have talked about making it into a movie, but it's sort of languished. I think they may have missed the window for the movie, um, in part because when he wrote this book, it was before comic books were fully mainstream the way they are now with all the comic movies, with all the superhero movies. Um, He might be able to do it, but it may have to be after the sort of current phase and wave of, of actual comic heroes. But anyway... So, Sammy discovers, uh, to to go into the story itself, Sammy discovers Yosef has artistic talent. They are hired by Sheldon Annapol, the head of a novelty company, uh, really a second-rate novelty company, who decide that they are going to, the the best way to sell products is basically to do what Superman did, which that's how Superman started as well. Um, we, We think of comics now as being sort of these standalone things. Most of them were written to promote something else, to sell x-ray glasses to sell birds drinking water, you name the cheap little plastic junk, that's what most comics were written for. Um, And so they get hired, um, Sammy and Joe get hired to do that. They get hired to make these comics and they come up with a variety of characters, the most popular of which ends up being the escapist. Um, Under the pseudonym of Sam Clay and Joe Cavalier, they write and they start it and then, this is a great line, they all get a lot of pressure, they keep having to write these things, they're on deadlines, and then this is a quote directly from the book. In the immoral, immemorial style of young men under pressure, they decided to lie down for a while and waste time. Um, I was reading this when I was in my 20s, so I think that might have been why I loved this book, at least for parts of it. Go ahead. So, um, with dreams of making money, the team develops the escapist, an anti-fascist hero who fights all the forces of evil. Since Joe's entire family... Um, is still in Nazi-occupied Prague. They have these heartrending letters back and forth within the book. Um, he's struggling to get his family out, and so the comic sort of takes on a darker and darker hue as he is more and more, Joe is more and more frustrated trying to get his family out. He indirectly, as an avatar, fights through the escapist, and it gets more and more bloody, more and more violent. Um, it sort of started off more as almost magic trick kind of ways of getting out. By the later ones, he's punching people in the face and hitting them in the head with crowbars and everything else trying to kill the Nazis. Um, they think they're going to make a mint, but ultimately, just like the same, this is true for actually almost all the creators of comics, they ultimately find out that um, all they are get are the hourly wages. The Escapist becomes this incredibly popular um, comic in the book where it's on the radio, they create a radio show, they have all these cascade, you know, they have all the merchandise, all the stuff, and Sammy and Joe sort of go to uh, Anna Paul and say, hey, where's our money, where's our cut? And he said, I've already paid you your cut, I've paid you your hourly wage. Um, and while, so while the owner of this second-rate novelty shop keeps getting richer, they get nothing more than their hourly wages. Um, sadly, this is true for almost all comics, Uh, comic writers and illustrators. Um, From the golden era and even up to now, there's only one or two comics that really share copyright licensing with the people who create the images. Um, The reason Marvel and DC, the two big boy comic book companies, tend to do so well is 
they pay their illustrators and writers a certain amount of money and then they keep all the other stuff. So when you buy a Hulk, it doesn't tend to go to Stan Lee, it tends to go first to Marvel and then all those folks within the company instead of out. Um, so, uh, Joe falls for a girl, Rosa, who is also an artist, incidentally, um, about this time in his personal life. So does Shaban. He falls in girl, love with a girl. She's also a writer. They end up getting married. That's his personal life background that seems to, I think was occurring, I think his courtship was about the same time that they were, uh, he was writing the book. Um, and Sammy, God bless him, begins to struggle with his sexual identity as a gay man. This is also a common theme in um, his books and Siobhan's books. I think almost all of them have a gay character trying to figure out where they fit in the world. Um, so much so that, you know, they had that picture of Siobhan um, being one of the 50 most beautiful people for People Magazine, or they invited him to. Um, shortly thereafter, he was identified as a gay man. And he said, I'm not gay, but I'm honored that you would think that. I just write about gay characters. Um, so it's one of those things, for whatever reason, that is close to his heart. Um, so Joe, again, becomes obsessed with getting his family out, as any of us would be getting out of a terrible situation, Nazi-occupied Nazi Prague. He keeps trying and trying, but as an escapist, he can't really... He's writing about the escapist, but he can't manage an escape for his family. It's this sort of horrible, dramatic irony of what's going on. Um, he works extra jobs. He fails again and again until he gets his, son, his brother on a, on a boat to the U.S., and sadly, the boat is sunk by a German U-boat, uh, and he's killed. Um, Joe becomes despondent. His life spirals out of control, and he leaves town size up for, uh, to go into the Navy to fight those ev evil guys. And when he does so, they station him in that battlefront of Antarctica. <laughs> and he's stuck in Antarctica where he can't fight anybody other than the guys he's with, and he's miserable. And then there's a freak accident. There's a carbon monoxide poisoning. The um, chimney gets partially blocked. The carbon monoxide poison kills everybody in the base except for him. And once again, for the second time in his life, he, he proves to be the only person who can escape from a situation. He's the only one of his family who can escape from Prague, and then during the war, he's the only one who can escape from this strange base in Antarctica. He comes home, he's despondent, he doesn't know what to do with his life. Um, meanwhile, Rosa, it turns out she didn't have the guts to tell Joe that she was pregnant with her child, with their child, and lets him sign up for the work. She doesn't know what else to do, and she's just a conflicted character throughout much of the book. So she just sort of keeps on. Um, he returns to New York, a broken man, and he ends up hiding out in the Empire State Building. That's why, where'd the book go? Um, that's why when you see the book, it almost always has the Empire State Building on the front cover, because he ends up hiding in a secret room in the Empire State Building, not only to magicians, it's sort of a secret room that's hidden up there, and he ends up living there, not making himself known to anybody else in his family. He just doesn't know what else to do with his life. Um, while this is happening, Sammy falls in love with the radio voice for the escapist, Tracy Bacon. Great Hollywood name if there ever was one. And, and please, be, please be very well aware, I guarantee you he meant to do it because Shaban's a good Jew. He meant to have his gay love fall in love with a man named Bacon. That's, that's not an accident. I guarantee you he meant to do that. Um, so Tracy Bacon um, invites Sammy, his gay lover, to come to Hollywood and to film the film version. And so they go out and they're having fun and they're doing, things seem to be going pretty well for Sammy until it's raided. Um, there's an FBI raid on the, the gay men that are gathered um, and he is arrested and taken to jail. And the FBI guys, um, is the next line on there? Yeah, he's sexually abused by the FBI. Um, that while he's in custody. Um, this is where Shaban really does some amazing storytelling, in my opinion. It's, it's dark material, but it's not sentimental. Um, it's not, this is the reality of a gay life in the 50s. It was hidden, it was marginalized, you were arrested for it, you were kicked out of things for it. It was not, it was not a good thing to be gay in that era. That was a hard thing. Um, 
and so I applaud him for making those, those darker choices and not making it just a happy, easy thing. Um, again, we're playing with this image and role of escapism and getting away. God bless Sammy. He cannot escape his gayness. He's fighting with it throughout the book. What does it mean, especially in a culture that doesn't accept him? So, scarred by this event, naturally, Sammy decides to keep a lower profile and does not travel with Tracy. And I can't really remember exactly with the breakup and all that, but he ends up going back to New York um, <clears throat> and reconnects with <clears throat> Rosa, who is raising Joe's daughter, and they end up getting married as, well, an escape to the idyllic suburbs. They try to manage a new life, a 50s life, that would be one of acceptance and one that they could go, we've, we finally have gotten away from all of our problems and all the other things that are going on because, hey, look, we're a straight, straight, normal couple with a boy and everything as well. The son, as he grows up, though, um, Tommy realizes that things aren't quite all cool in the home and somehow through a variety of luck he ends up taking magic lessons from his biological father who was hiding out in the, the Empire State Building. Um, it's, a great, it's a great turn of events in the book. It's pretty hilarious. Um, but anyway, so again, the son, the, we're playing with, again, these images of escape and how do you escape from things, but how do you end up right in the middle of things anyway? One escape ends up being a metamorphosis. He's playing with that imagery again of, well, we've escaped from one thing and we think we've changed radically. Oh, no, it's actually my dad. <laughs> I'm not learning magic from some magical new person. It's my biological father. And so he's there and, and um, he ends up bringing them back together through a variety of conversations. He eventually realizes those connections and brings back Cavalier and Clay. He's, a, he's the one who gets them back home. Uh, Joe eventually moves in and they have no longer the normal 50s family. They have two dads, a mom and a son. <laughs> but they're pretty happy and things seem to be looking better <laughs> until tragically, um, uh, yeah, so they come back, they're trying to write a new comic, but sadly, Sammy's homosexuality is revealed on TV. Um, and I would argue as a sort of critique byproduct, what Shaban is playing with brilliantly is he's looking at this and saying, okay, once upon a time it was the print word, now it's TV, it's a new media. And comic books days are transitioning and they're over as a dominant source of entertainment. Now it's going to television and those comics and those lives are forever being changed by that transition in media. Um, but he's discovered, he's outed, and then, hey, uh, Joe and Rosa uh, beg and attempt to convince Sammy to stay, to be a family, but guess what happens? Sammy chooses to escape. And the book concludes with him escaping. Not really sure to what or to where, but he, he takes off. Um, it's a fascinating book. It's a great book. Uh, let's see. I think that's it, right? Yeah. So that is the book in a nutshell. He is playing with these images, playing with this idea of escape, and also playing with this idea that sometimes we need heroes and folks to be our avatars, our golems, those folks that proxy fight those battles to help us understand our battles better. Um, throughout the book, you have two narratives going at the same time. One, the escapist narrative, and can the good guy get away? But it's also trying, it's these two, these two cousins, Sammy and Joe, Sam and Yosef, trying to figure out how can they escape as well. Um, part of why I love the book so much, I have a, a love of comics, um, and that's what good comic books are doing. So actually... If you go and see a comic movie right now, the best ones are the ones who are actually addressing current issues and trying to make some sense of them. Um, if you watch the recent Batman trilogy, especially The Dark Knight, the second one, there's a whole sequence where Batman is trying to use cell phones to listen in on every person in Gotham. <laughs> That's two years before Snowden revealed that the US was using every cell phone to snoop in all of America. Um, the best comics are doing that work, for that matter, the best stories are doing that work of us. We tell stories so that we can understand the world around us, and that's the brilliance of his book, is he's 
telling a story within a story within a story, each one trying to peel back a layer of understanding, trying to, on some level, to get there. And the tragedy, both of our lives and of the book, the part that's hard to read as you get a little bit farther in, is we're always sort of stuck not fully getting it. We can write a book about it and say, here's exactly what this means, and then you look at their own life and it's, well, not quite there. Um, I would argue that's the same as our life as people of faith, we have the scripture, we can read interpretations of the scripture, midrash on midrash on the scripture, and we get to a certain point, and then as Paul says, then we go and do the things we're not supposed to do, or we end up in a mess anyway. Um, it's why stories can both inspire us, and then also, to a certain degree, make us really depressed, because we realize we can't ever quite get there. So, um, that's why I love the book, that's why I, I recommend it to anyone um, Yes, there are lots of, there's lots of sex and lots of gay folks in it, and, but I think it's handled all within that context. So that's, that's how our lives work. They're messy and convoluted, and you also end up in these weird sort of indirect things instead of a straight line like we want it to be. Um, so I, again, I commend it to you, and I'd be happy to chat for a few minutes if you all have any questions or reflections.